Okay. Hey, so today we have uh, Dr. Brad Osborne. Welcome to um, the Warren Music <laughs> YouTube experience. Thanks. So Thanks for far, having me. it's not going so great. We had a few, few false starts, but uh, Professor Osborne is a professor of music theory at uh, the University of Kansas. Right on. Thank you. Very cool. Very cool. So um, at the University of Kansas, you're teaching music theory, but but I assume you know you're not just teaching one class, like you know the beginners music theory. Can you can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, what what you're teaching over at University of Kansas? Yeah, sure. So right now I'm actually teaching a doctoral seminar on Radiohead, which is super cool. Wow. Uh, and that's only available to graduate students in music. Um, I do teach also the first year music theory courses. So I have like 100 students who, you know, I teach them sometimes like how to read the bass clef. Uh, wow. But we get all the way up through like, you know, applied dominant chords and thing. And, and then I teach a course on how to teach music theory to graduate students who will be teachers someday. That's nice. Yeah. And then I teach a class on uh, Beethoven, Mozart, Mozart, and Haydn as well, like super yeah. classical stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So we, we got a whole range of history, yeah. you know, represented right. right in front of us right here. So <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Um, so um, w I invited you to uh, come and join um, me on this music channel because, you know, partly, you know, we're, I, I think we are both a little kindred spirits in the sense that we're uh, crazy about this, this little band called Radiohead. I mean, I prepared a few questions for you. Uh, a few of them are going to be uh, about your book called Everything in Its Right Place. Bing! Right there. Nice. Nice little <laughs> placement there. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's uh, it came out last year, and I'm just curious, you know, maybe I can ask you this um, the way I've written it, so I don't go too far off track here, but you've done a lot of thinking and writing about music and specifically about the music of Radiohead. And since you started to apply your efforts across Radiohead's expansive body of work, what are some of the more fascinating musical ideas you've uh, come across in, in the process? Yeah. Well, you know, for like individual interesting ideas, um, I wrote a blog post last year called The Nine Most Thought-Provoking Moments in Radiohead. Um, so if people want those little tiny hidden gems, they'll check that out. Yeah. But more generally, what I, what I found most interesting about Radiohead are the song forms, mm. the way that they don't stick to verse chorus or strophic song forms like we're used to in most pop rock music. Mm -hmm. They do these two forms that are that are pretty unique. One is called terminally climactic form, where they go verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and then they just throw this like brand new section at you. So mm -hmm. like karma police ends in that, you know, right. for, for a minute, minute there, there, I lost yeah. myself. Yeah. We've never heard that, and that's how the song ends. Uh, and, and this this form has a history starting in the early 90s. So some other rock bands do it. But the frequency with which Radiohead uses that form is unparalleled throughout mm. their entire output. They do that quite a bit. You know, in the book, I list probably like 20 songs that have that form. Um, another weirder form they do even less is what I call through composed form, where they have sections A going to B, going to C, and they actually don't recapitulate anything. Mm. And, you know, for that, the only precedents are really like classical music of the early 20th and 19th centuries. Yeah. So that, that's pretty interesting. I sort of want them to do it more. There's at least one song on the new album that I think does it. So yeah, that'll wait. That'll wait for the second edition, though. Yeah, very cool. So you're gonna have to quickly make an expanded and updated edition <laughs> to, to this book. I mean, yeah. Uh, one of the coolest things I, I think uh, that, in my experience about radio, is is they just keep innovating and innovating, and and that may be something more consistent throughout than any particular one sound or, or technique it's, it's just this love of innovation you know kind yeah. of integrating a lot of um, influences from the different band members and just being really brave to, to make some new sounds um, so um, that's really great we can you know uh, put the link to to that blog um, in the video description oh, cool. where, where you kind of 
uh, list some other. You said the nine most interesting. Yeah, it's like a it's like a David Letterman. What's it, sort what's of it called again? The the title. The nine most nine most thought provoking moments in Radiohead. Yeah, nine most thought provoking moments in Radiohead. Really, so. really these kind of moments. You know? mm, mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, maybe we can get into it, like maybe one or two specific of of them. Um, if I can just ask this question here. Um, Let's talk about some of the higher level concepts that are in your book specifically, like Euclidean rhythm uh, oh, yeah, that or, or maximal evenness. You know, these are uh, really interesting terms that I'm sure like a lot of people have not come across in their day to day conversations about yeah. music. So can you unpack that a little bit and uh, also share um, maybe, you know, any concepts that you've been kind of coming across maybe outside Radiohead but still in your music research that, that you find you find exciting these days sure okay well I'll start with maximally yeah. even rhythms and I hope I can go to the piano and maybe demonstrate yeah. some stuff okay oh. cool so nice um so I got this idea because you know Radiohead has some funky rhythms we'd all agree right yeah I agree and so sure. here's like one of my favorite from the national anthem uh, right everyone yeah. loves that rhythm um Everyone loves this rhythm too. Yeah. Right, and those sound like totally different rhythms, but in fact, they have something really in common, and it's the maximal even property. So I'll talk about what that means. So both of those rhythms have seven attack points. Do 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 do. Okay, and then dum da dum 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 dum, and they're both spread out of a a grid of sixteen sixteenth notes. So one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. So we're spacing those seven notes as evenly as possible, maximally evenly, over the sixteen points. So I always use the analogy to to pi, not not the scary math number. Don't worry. But let's say you have a pie cut into sixteen slices. Yeah. And you have seven guests come over, and you want to serve the pie as evenly as possible, but you can't cut it anymore. Yeah. So the answer would be five people get two pieces of pie, mm -hmm. and two people get three pieces of pie. Now, that's exactly the same number of counts that each of those attack points in the rhythm gets. Do, 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 two, two, three, two, 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 three. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's that's the Euclidean right. uh, algorithm. Right. That's how we solve that 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 mathematic quandary. So, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, none of the guests in Radiohead's Music Pie get four and one slice. Like it's some yeah. kind of uneven all, dinner party. All t all twos and threes because we want all them. twos and threes. So. You know, it's, as, it's as as close to the the average of yeah. of if you would get you know sixteen slices and seven people eating what they're getting as close to the average amount of pie as possible right and that's what makes it so funky I think because it's almost even right it's almost evenly distributed mm -hmm. but it's just a little off and mm -hmm. that's I think what makes us sort of bob our heads to those rhythms very cool very cool yeah. <laughs> That's that's an interesting concept, and I imagine, you know, anytime you're you're hearing something like this and noticing and and perhaps seeing commonalities across songs or across albums or or even across you know artists and genres, you're you're able to to look at that idea and not just leave it there, but then also think, hmm, you know, maybe maybe this is a key to some more composition. Let me explore this right. idea when I'm going to write some rhythm. Is that, is that right, you think? Absolutely. I mean, maybe me more than others, I'm a music theorist, so I tend to make generalizations. But yeah, you can take this theory and you can then compose, you know, a five note rhythm over 16 or a nine over 16 yeah. rhythm. And just and do a little bit they're funky. Of, of math or, or maybe for those of us who are not able to hold all these numbers, uh, maybe we can just look at a pie. Or you could just look and pie. color it in and let that begin uh, <laughs> the process of writing something maybe somebody might not have written otherwise, like without kind of yeah, thinking I, about that idea, right? I'll expect a tutorial from you coming soon on, <laughs> on how to use pie to write. even songwriting, you know, yeah. seed, song, seeds of songwriting, you know. And yeah, I'll, but you have this I'll great way of credit. like showing really really high level stuff with really uh, easy to grasp concepts. So I think you could do it. <laughs> cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
Uh, third question I have for you now, you know, since we've talked about a little bit how there are these higher level concepts, but then, you know, there's a desire, I think, you know, on the part of any any kind of amateur musician or, you know, seasoned musician to to take uh, interesting insights, but then also do something with them. So as a researcher uh, that deals with these higher level concepts and and maybe even a little bit more esoteric language, you know, maybe from the av average person's point of view. Uh, what does your personal relationship uh, to music theory look like at home, like with your guitar or p your piano? I think you play drums and sing as well, right? So what, yeah, what does yeah. that look like? Uh, my sort of standard answer there is that, that theory helps songwriting. And I think you'd agree from the tutorials you do. Oh, uh, oh just, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that... Well, yes, okay. I would agree. I would agree for All sure. Right. Well, so to give you an example, I was uh, I was writing a song in my band Dark Archipelago called uh, "By the Lights of Gamora." It's a metal tune in like seven eight, pretty heady stuff. Um, but I was just doing it by ear at the guitar, and then when I stepped back from it, I was like, "Oh no, I have an F chord going to a B chord. That's like a tritone. Like, mm -hmm. what on earth am I going to do with that?" So I found myself stuck in this moment, and I think it's when we find ourselves stuck as songwriters that theory can give us ideas. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself. Well said. Actually, where where do we find an F chord going to a B chord? Oh, we find that in the key of A minor. So next I'll go E major, A minor, and that yeah. next section is in A minor. And all of a sudden, this like crazy but awesome idea ahead of the guitar, now I know what to do with it because I know sort of from experience where those things happen. Right. And, and I know that, that theory can be stifling if it's taught to you in the wrong way, especially as a young person, mm -hmm. if it's rules-based. Um, yeah. So I, I never teach my students that there are rules to music theory. Just, you know, if you want to sound a certain way, here are some tricks to get there. Mm -hmm. If you don't, mm -hmm. ignore my advice altogether. You sure, know? sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really think that approach sounds very, very sensible. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, here's some great ideas that uh, these songwriters and these bands have used or things that I've discovered. And, and, you know, we use language to kind of transmit them, you know, to other people. And then a lot of times people shut down, right? They shut down because, yeah. oh, you know, that, that's, that's too crazy for me. But, but this idea that, you know, hey, this is just a way to get unstuck. Maybe here's an obstacle. But then instead of running straight into it, hey, music theory affords us a way to go around it, go in a different direction, right? Yeah. It's pretty well cool. Said. Yeah. yeah. So I talk to my students a lot about this. And um <clears throat> I think, you know, it kind of goes pretty well into the next question, too, um, where it's, you know, there there are these common hurdles. I don't know if you have encountered these. I guess I'm guessing that you have. Uh, but there are these common hurdles to maybe learning music theory. Maybe one of them is just the stigma that music theory is, you know, OK, it's totally cerebral. And if I learn it, I'm afraid that it'll kill my creative impulses. Have you ever heard this one before? Oh, I, I, I went through it. I mean, I was an yeah. undergraduate in theory too. It killed my impulses for a while. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it did yeah. kill your impulses. And, and what did, did that do? What it, did it? Did it devastate your musicianship <laughs> and then reduce you to a puddle of, of inaction? Is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that if, you, if you listen to my music from like freshman year, it's using chords that are all over the place, not in any key. Mm. Um, but then if you listen to my music from like junior year of college, it's sort of like stiflingly in a key all the time mm. because I'd kind of been taught that like, okay, things should be in keys. And it probably wasn't until after I graduated that I kind of assimilated those two things into, okay, now I can kind of do what I want, but now I have ideas about what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it can be stifling for a while, but I think ultimately... It's good for you, and you will overcome it. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Well said. Yeah. So I think I think when you kind of um, talk about you know it's stifling you for a while, it sounds like maybe you had a an intuitive approach of a, a an intuitive approach originally that was to some extent you know maybe more or less working for you. Yeah. And then you brought in maybe the theory, less. and you thought, okay, hey, maybe this is actually the way that it should work. And in retrospect, you're like, well, everything is just kind of square now. But then mm. you you kind of mentioned assimilating those two, and yeah. being able to pick and choose, maybe from from 
those two different methods where if we could you know simplify it's like i'm leading with my ear or i'm leading with my concepts you know about music and so maybe there's a little bit of picking and choosing that yeah. that ends up being you know the way forward where, rather than not having a choice at right all. wouldn't you always wouldn't you always want to know more and then choose not to implement it than just not know it true <laughs> that's a good point that's a very good point so um you know when i you know specifically the people who are are watching uh this channel a lot of uh, what's on this channel is tutorials. There are a few um, more music analysis videos. There's a few silly videos of, of me in the car just turning on the radio and trying to kind of you know, talk about what's going on in the song musically. Um, but what would you say, you know, as, as a professor of music theory, you know, maybe speaking to some people who maybe enjoy playing the music of Radiohead or maybe some of the other bands that, that they try and look for tutorials on YouTube for, um, but maybe wants to take their musicianship to the next level, but are a little mm -hmm. bit hesitant about jumping into theory. You know, what, what would you have to say to them, you think? Well, I, I, I really like what you're doing here, and I agree with this sort of three-pronged approach that you have theory, you have ear training, and you have performance. And I think that anyone can learn any of those things on their own by themselves like you can pick up a book like mine and read it and learn theory you can take a book of melodies into the woods with you and practice sight singing and get really good at, at your training um, and of course performance we get better at every day but I think that if you can link those things together if you can start to begin to link your performance with your ear training with your theory I think that's really where you begin to excel um, my only question for people is, are you going to spend the time doing that five days a week every day on your own? Or do you need a coach you know, like you? Or maybe you <laughs> yeah. go to school? Because yeah. I, I don't think many people these days have the, the self-drive to like wake up every morning at 8 a.m. Yeah. and sit in their, in their house and like teach themselves ear training. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's tough without a community you may, or a dedicated you, teacher. Yeah, yeah community. That, that, that you make a great point there. And, and it's like... It's like you're, you know, reading my mind for, for the next question even. Uh, I think um, <clears throat> what, what I was going to ask next is, is just this idea that like, you know, do you feel like maybe the formal route of, you know, going to a university and taking classes from a professor like yourself is, is the best way forward? Or do you think maybe we live in a world where, I think you kind of answered this already, but like where we wake up and we just can do a quick, you know, Google and then find all of the music theory information that we need to kind of activate our own musicianship per individual study, yeah. you know, like, or do we live kind of somewhere in between? And, and I think you, you kind of touch on a key thing, which is like community and just right. having somebody around that, Hey, maybe, you know, so I, if you, if you could speak on that a little bit. Sure. I mean, I think it's all about the, the commitment with a good teacher. So if somebody called you like on Google Hangouts every morning at 8, five days a week, I think they'd get just the same education as a university. Um, now, let's say that you just want to be a session musician. Mm -hmm. You probably don't need to go to university. If you just want to be like the best guitar player you can and move to Nashville and sit in a studio, um, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you to go to music school for that. Mm -hmm. But let's keep in mind that there are very different kinds of music schools out there. So maybe that guitarist actually should go to like Berklee College of Music and just learn how to play the guitar. Right? But sort of one step more removed from that, we're starting to see dedicated music industry programs pop up at universities. So Elon University and the University of Rochester now have music degrees that are all about popular music. Hmm. So you don't have to learn about Mozart if you don't want to, right? <laughs> One step more moved, we've got universities like where I work at, like a comprehensive school of music where you'll learn about African drumming and Mozart and Radiohead. Um, but probably the last place I would tell a guitarist to go would be like a classical conservatory, such as, I don't know, Peabody or Juilliard. Um, you know, because these are things that are outside what you want to do with your life. But then I stop myself because I actually think that some of the most interesting music being made today is being made by people who do have classical training and then apply it to like the pop music world. So like 
the cellist Zoe <clears> Johnny <throat> Greenwood. Um, Johnny Greenwood. <clears throat> or <laughs> Joanna Newsom, the yeah. harpist who dropped out of Mills College, you know, Spencer yeah. Krug. Uh, and even like the opposite side of the spectrum, these real like classical composers like Max Richter and Olaf R. Arnolds who are who are really classically trained people but are having they're applying their knowledge to the pop world. I think that crossover is where some really interesting music should be made can be made is being made and, and for that reason i might actually tell the guitarist to go study mozart yeah yeah you know i actually gave i gave a lecture once and this has a silly name i'm going to tell you about the silly name it's called everything i know about rock music i learned from franz schubert where i showed several of my pieces that use chords that i would have learned nowhere else except studying 19th century art song <laughs> You know, and yeah. I think there's something to be said for that kind of creativity, how you can take something from one realm in the 18th century and bring it into 21st century mm -hmm. music. So that's my yeah. two cents worth. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds to me like, um, you know, that's that's a that's all great. Everything you said was 100 percent, I feel like right there, just hitting the nail on the head. Um, but it sounds to me like you're you're you know, even though you are kind of in a more academic setting, Right where there's the structure of you know, students coming and going to class, and there are units and grades and things like that. Um, it sounds to me like you you believe in a really like a holistic approach Absolutely. to your musicianship. It's like if you want to make music, don't just be stuck in any one maybe tradition or one kind of um, I guess in one cave, you know, not not coming right. out. Let, let's see what's out there, right? Let's let's pick and choose. Let's let's listen to some Icelandic composers, you know. Let's listen to some um, free jazz. Let's 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 see what's interesting out there, and then maybe assimilate it and integrate it into our own uh, musicianship that that means something to us because we're actually still curating, we're still selecting from all that's out there, and deciding what we like. And kind yeah. of using that to inform uh, the music that we want to make, right? Yeah, and I hope my students get exactly that out of it. Um, sometimes in the day-to-day -day grind, it can be like, oh my god, when's he going to shut up about augmented sixth chords? But, you know, <laughs> eventually, I think they're going to make more interesting music because of it. I, I think that I don't teach music theory. I think I teach music. Yeah. You know, I, I teach this like, holistic thing. And sure. I would say I teach songwriting maybe more than anything. But, mm, mm. yeah. Man, I think our experiences are quite similar. Yeah. 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 So, so one of the things I've been playing around with this uh, recently is uh, some of my students have have come to me initially to kind of learn music theory because you know that's that's kind of the topic that um, comes up a lot in in videos where where we want to kind of maybe invite the student to go beyond learning just one song. That's usually the first subject that comes up is, is music theory. Um, so a lot of times students come to me, they start with music theory, but eventually the end result is, you know, I want to start writing. I want to start writing. Mm. And, and the real goal has always been actually to to find their own voice musically. Yeah. And whether that ends up becoming an album or just, a, you know, a set that people play at open mic, uh, all of that, you know, can be a result or, or like the, the, um, the overflow of finding just a unique musical voice and mm -hmm. that that's something that i think that you know and that's like right along with with what you're saying that's pretty awesome I, I think i would be really privileged if you know when i were younger and in college if i got to you know sit in on your class it was pretty oh cool. thanks man yeah. that's nice to say so a lot of it comes obviously down to what we're hearing uh, that's always first and foremost right the, the songs that we're hearing the songs that we're attracted to but then there's an important kind of, you know, link before we're just making music and being able to kind of integrate, let's get this lighting a little more even, uh, before we're able to integrate all those ideas. They don't just kind of become absorbed through osmosis in every case. Yeah. I find that a lot of times what's happening in the middle is there needs to be some breakdown of the music. There needs to be some way to kind of talk about the ideas in the music to observe and, and to analyze right before they kind of just start to inform the music we're making uh on in in any kind of deep way you know what i mean yeah. other than the surface level oh i ripped off this chord progression or i i use this chord shape because i saw my favorite band use it in some video 
usually there are some kinds of ideas of like, okay, maybe we're going to talk about Euclidean rhythm or, or maximal evenness or, or terminally climactic form, right? These types of things can kind of inform a little bit more consciously on a deeper level. And, and, and my um, experience with kind of talking with people about music theory, especially ever since the, uh, the recent Vox video uh, <laughs> response, uh, has been kind of almost like two different approaches. And I, and I think I kind of already have a feeling about your answer here, but a lot of people have been advocating and saying, well, you know, the music that you listen to, all you need to do is analyze it using Western music theory methods. This kind of tradition of music analysis has been handed down um, by a lot of, you know, Italians that are very, very smart, you know, figured out how to, you know, transcribe music, you know, 400 years ago. And we can do that. And, and everything we need to know about the song is in the song. We don't need to read interviews. We don't need to have quotes from the band. We don't want to have to worry about anything beyond the context of the song. And let's just look at a song in a vacuum and kind of just analyze music that way. And then there's this other approach, okay? And I'm from an ethnomusicology background. And this other approach says, you know what, context does matter, actually. You know, if Tom York says that this really slow song is actually a fast song, you should listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And we're back to videotape. Yeah, yeah. back to videotape, right? right. You know, I can't help it. It's been bouncing around in my mind. But, uh, you know, this idea of there being kind, being kind of a two contrasting approaches, almost like a, like a traditional me a method of analysis where... You can look at a song, but just really, really pay attention to all the notes that you're hearing and the notes on the page versus, you know, kind of like an outside kind of thing where, hey, maybe the music analysis methods used on music from, you know, hundreds of years ago, maybe they may not fit perfectly for new music today. Right. So, right. so what do you think about all that? Okay, I'm gonna try to be concise. Here. Um, <laughs> You've been really but, concise uh, so far. It's amazing. I'm, to I'm me. pretty passionate about. I don't this. have right, that so. gift. I'm I'm gonna take issue with just like one one word in there. You're calling it the Western classical method of okay, analysis. Sure. Now I would I would argue that it is a Western method of analysis. I'll agree with you there. Mm. But I don't think it's linked to classical music. I think it's linked to the Western tradition of music of tonality. Mm. And we it's really hard to unlearn three hundred years of tonal music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm. Like it or not, we're born with like children's songs in our head, which means we're born with Mozart and Brahms in mm -hmm, our head, mm -hmm. right? So all I'm doing when I when I apply these methods of analysis to Radiohead's music is applying theoretically the things that are already in all Westerners ears. Yeah, things so were socialized it... from a young age. Yeah, uh, in, yeah. In our musical environment that we we didn't really even have a choice about, but but we're we're immersed yeah. in it from the time that we're with right. from the time that we grow up. And so whether or not we should pay attention to an artist's intention, for example, Tom York, who doesn't read Western notation, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, this is, this is something that critical theorists solved for us a long time ago called the intentionalist fallacy, meaning that to pay too much attention to an artist's desire uh, is, is a bit faulty. So here we're going to disagree, and I'll sure. give you a couple of reasons why we're going to disagree. Uh, one, I think when you interview an artist about why they did something originally, the human memory system is pretty bad. So can an artist really remember exactly what they were thinking when they created a piece? I'm sure not. Um, the second reason is artists have too much of an incentive to lie about why they created something. So on the one hand, if someone asks me, Mr. Osborne, tell us about how you create your music. I've got a lot of incentive to say, Oh man, I don't know. Just like feel it because it sounds aloof and rock and roll. <laughs> and Tom York does this all it's the very time, mysterious. right? Very mysterious. Yeah. On the on the other hand, I also have the incentive to say, oh well, I plot out all of the twelve tone graphs and the retrograde inversion networks, and I work through all logical possibilities, and that's my mm. music. Because then I sound really smart. Mm. So for either of those reasons, the memory or the incentive, I tend to distrust uh, what an artist says they were thinking when they composed a piece. Hmm. Now, more importantly to me is that's one person's opinion. So Tom York is one person. He says, here's how I compose this piece. I'm actually more interested in the millions of listeners whose lives have been affected by that piece. So a million opinions versus one opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's for that reason in the book that, you know, obviously I can't talk about 
one million interpretations of pyramid song. Sure. But what I can talk about is what I call an intersubjective interpretation. So if you say, oh, I hear that song and it reminds me of this pink hippopotamus doll I had when I was a child. No, no one can hear that. That's only you, right? Mm -hmm. But if you say, I hear this song and it reminds me of the Beatles because it has the same two chord progression as A Hard Day's Night. Then all of a sudden you have an intersubjective interpretation that other people can hear because they know that Beatles song. Mm. So that's what I'm looking for, that in-between space where it's your own interpretation but also couched in something that others can hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that um, our own interpretation isn't something that is just kind of out of left field maybe, you know, where, it's, where it's nobody else can left re field. relate to it, you mean? Yeah, it, it comes from something. Yeah. Something in the music sparked your individual interpretation. And, you know, my job is to uncover what it was in the music that made you think that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's so awesome. Oh, man, we, we could probably go on and on about, about this one. This one. This one is a good, good topic for a lot of discussion. Um, but, you know, I know you don't have too much more time. No, I actually so, have a class to teach, so yeah. Yeah, you got to run <laughs> soon. You know, I do did have a few more questions, but maybe sure, you know sure. we'll we'll skip to the 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 good part, maybe the um, juicy one. All right, what's yeah. the juicy one? <laughs> so um, there, uh, you know, you mentioned kind of you know um, in in one of your book descriptions, I think it says that um, there's a theory of perception known as uh, ecological perception, right? Right. And um, could you sum that up real briefly and how that sure. kind of in, impacts, you know, what, how you wanted to organize the information that you're putting in the book? Sure. So, so in a nutshell, you know, we live in a modern musical world, but the hardware we use to process that world, that being the human brain, mm -hmm. you know, is still like an ancient piece of machinery. In short, our hardware has not caught up to the modern musical world. Mm -hmm. So we're still using like 15,000 year old perceptual tools when we listen to Radiohead's <laughs> music. You know, evolution's a really small, a really long process. Yeah. We don't evolve overnight. So it, it turns out, and we can test this in the lab, that um, people are most interested in seeking the meaning of sounds that are not sounds they hear every day. Not totally new sounds they've never heard before, but in fact, sounds somewhere in the middle. Mm. So things that sound kind of like something I've heard before, but have this weird novelty to them. That's what probes people to think more deeply about music. Hmm. And I would argue, and I think you would agree with me, that Radiohead, more than any other artist, in their song form, in their harmony, in their timbres, and especially in their rhythms, they're in that Goldilocks zone in the middle. They give you things that are kind of like you've heard before, but they're yeah. kind of a little weird. And I think that's why we think so deeply about their music. And little known fact, the first title of my book was actually Everything in Its Right Place, the Goldilocks principle in Radiohead, <laughs> meaning, meaning that they're always in the middle between like, yeah, the expected yeah. and the far out, um, sure. but the reviewers thought it sounded childish, so I had to scrap it. <laughs> I actually like that title, that little you yeah. know, kind of second I, title there. I like it too, and you'll find it mentioned only once in Chapter 6. <laughs> I, I managed to get that one through the reviewers, just once. Oh, that's good, that's good. So, yeah. you know, not too hot, not too cold, but just right, you know? And, just and right. in the case of you know, writing music, um, not too boring, not too out there. No, yeah, exactly. But exactly. somewhere somewhere right in the middle. And, and Radiohead, yeah. they zero in on that. And if there were a button, they're pushing that button <laughs> as, you know, like, like it's a video game. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like that's that's a really good that's a really good way to kind of understand Radiohead sound. And what's really cool is yeah. when they go a little too far out in the timbre, like on the the track Kid A, like such weird sounds happening. <laughs> they dial back the song form. It's like a strophic form. Mm. Or if they like go crazy on the song form, they sort of dial back and they do it with just drums, guitar, and bass. So they're aware of this middle space. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think yeah. they are. You know, and even if they aren't aware of it consciously, every member there is at least some kind of intuitive pull intuitive, towards yeah, there, yeah. right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Amazing, amazing. So so maybe the last question before you have to run is, um, is videotapes piano syncopated? <laughs> and why is the answer yes? Uh, okay, why is the answer yes? I love it, I love it. <laughs> well, yes, then, okay. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that was great. That's interview. all your time for. <laughs> yes, it is syncopated. <laughs> well, you know, thank you so much. Um, 
I, I really appreciate your time, Brad. Uh, hopefully, we can do this again sometime. This was this I'd was love to. awesome. I, I would love to pick your brain even more. I'm sure there are a lot of things that we could even go uh, back and forth on, especially because you know, we have a shared musical history with with Radiohead, but also with um, you know children's lullabies and Mozart. <laughs> you know, just bouncing around in our childhood perceptions. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so. Your best of luck um, with this book, uh, everything in its right place, analyzing Radiohead. I got to say, um, there needs, I think you're, you're in good company. There needs to be a lot more uh, stuff, out, literature on the music of Radiohead and, and what's going on in, in uh, modern music today with a, with a critical lens. So that's pretty cool that uh, you've put something like that together. Um, you should be very proud. Thanks, and, Warren. Uh, so hopefully uh, viewers of this channel, you know, uh, if you're interested, uh, check it out. Um, you know, check it out. Boom, right there. And and also we'll include a link to that um, that blog post about some, some of the nine oh, cool. most thought-provoking moments in, in Radiohead's music. Okay. Yeah. All right. Have a nice day, Warren. Uh, thank you so much, Brad. Take it easy. See you. Bye.